and go. Hey, good day everyone. It's Dr. Jose Tavares. For those of you who don't know me, in case your friends or family are watching with your students, um, I'm glad to ha have you come back. Welcome. Let's go ahead and get started on today's lecture. So today's lecture is on chapter 11. What are we gonna learn today? We're gonna talk about an independent sample t-test. So let me go ahead and go to the next slide. We'll get started. All right, so what are we gonna learn in chapter 11? We're gonna learn when to use a t-test, right? We're gonna learn how to compute the answer to a t-test, also known as the observed or found value or the obtained value. And after we get an answer, we have to interpret, we have to be able to tell people what does our answer mean. Right. So let's first find out by using this flow chart that's in your book, when should we be using an independent sample t-test? So the first question we need to ask is, hey, are we looking to see if there's a relationship among variables or are we looking for differences between means? You know, are we looking to see if the average score for men is different than the average score for women? That would be an example, right? For this test, for this chapter, we are examining the differences between the means from groups. Right? We're looking at the differences between the averages. So the next question on our flow chart is, are these participants, are these people or things that are in our study, are they being measured, observed, or are they being tested once or more than once? If they're being tested more than once, we go that way. But the people in our study are only going to be measured or observed or recorded or tested once. So we're gonna to go to the right on our flow chart. And then the next question is, how many groups are you studying, right? How many groups are you dealing with, right? Do you have two groups, right? Or do you have more than two groups, right? We have two groups, right? It's men versus women, boys versus girls, uh, independents versus Republicans, right? We have two separate, mutually exclusive groups. You're in one group or the other, but you can't be in both. So the right test to do is a t-test for independent sample, right? Independent means the two groups are not related. They're separate, right? So let me go to our next slide. So we've determined that this is the right test to use, right? So the independent sample t-test is used when you have two groups that are independent. That means they're not related, they're separate. Each group is being tested or measured only once. And we want to know, is there a difference between the groups? So these are also known as between groups designs. Whenever you want to know, is there a difference among the groups? You're doing a between groups design. Okay, next slide. All right. So in order for us to use the test and be able to trust our answer from the test, we have to follow some basic rules. In statistics, the rules we have to follow are called assumptions. So these are the assumptions for an independent sample t-test, right? Assumptions are the rules you should follow in order to use the test. If you don't follow the rules, if you violate the assumptions, it's really hard to be able to trust that the answer you got from the test is the right answer. So, a t-test has a major assumption. The independent sample t-test has a major rule that you have to follow. It is called homogeneity of variance. Homo, meaning one, and geneity has the word gene in it, it means from one and the same. That's basically what it means. It means that the variance, or the variability in each of the two groups is equal. Now, they don't have to be exactly equal. Right? They just cannot be significantly different. So what are we saying? We're saying that the variance from the first group is about the same equals about the variance from the second group. That's what we're saying. If this is true, then we can trust the results of the test. Right? The amount of variance from each test or group cannot be extremely different. In other words, they're not equal about. They're just about the same. Right? So that's tilde. That means about. So there's my variance for group one. There's my variance for group two. And we're saying that they're not really different. Okay, 
here is our formula, right? So, let's take a look at it. T is the formula, if T equals a fraction, underneath the fraction, there's this giant square root symbol. Because we wanna know, is there a difference between two groups, underneath the square root symbol, we have two parts, right? Let me explain the numerator first. The numerator is the difference between the means of the two groups. So this is x bar one, this is the average of our first group, the mean of the first group, and this is x bar two, this is the mean of the average of the second group, all right? Let's take a look at the denominator, right? The denominator tells us the amount of variation within and between each of the two groups. How does it do that? We're gonna take the number of people in the first group, N1, that's our sample size for the first group, minus one, times the variance of the first group, plus the number of people in group two, minus one. We're gonna take that quantity, we're gonna multiply it by the variance of the second group. All of that is gonna be divided by the total sample size, the number of people in group one plus the number of people in group two, minus two. So say why minus two? Because we have two groups. Right. The second part over here is a weight. The groups don't have to be the same size. They could be different sizes. So to adjust for that, we have a weight over here. What's the fraction over here? It's the number of people in group one plus the number of people in group two. That's our total sample size divided by N1 times N2 times the product of the sizes of both groups, right? This is our formula. Oh, let's take a look at it slightly differently. All right? Whoops, wrong way. All right. First of all, let me show you that the second fraction is actually us adding the two fractions, right? We have one over the sample size of group one plus one over the sample size of group two. So this is another way you can write it. It might be easier for you to remember to write it this way. How does this change into the formula that I just showed you? Well, when you, two, when you have two fractions with different denominators, how do you add them? Well, first you have to change them so that they have common denominators. So we're basically going to do something that looks like cross multiplication. We're gonna multiply the top and bottom of the first fraction by N2. So this becomes one times N2 over N1 times N2. And then we're gonna multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by N1. So we have N1 times one over N1 times N2. So what does this equal? Well, this equals N2 plus N1 all over N1 times N2, right? Because now they both have the same common denominator. And since addition, right, the order doesn't matter, I can rewrite this as N1 plus N2 all over N1 times N2. So that explains why this looks a little different. What else can I show you, right? This first part of the denominator is called the pooled estimator of the variance. What does pooled mean? Pooled means you are combining or adding together. So we're adding the variances, right? Okay. So let me show you one more slide. Oh, wait a minute, Jose. How did you get this? Well, let me show you how I got this. Right. What did I do? Well, in the previous slide, I showed you that the sample size of group one minus one is going to be multiplied by the variance of the first group, right? Let me rewrite the variance, right? The formula for the variance is the sum of the differences squared all over n minus one, right? And if this is the first group, doesn't this cancel that? Yeah, so what am I left with, right? I'm left with the top part, the sum of the differences squared, also known as the sum of squares, right? 
What is this called? I hope you remember, this is our degrees of freedom. All right, there's our degrees of freedom. So, I wanted to rewrite this formula. This would be the sum of the squares for the first group plus the sum of the squares for the second group divided by the degrees of freedom from the first group plus the degrees of freedom from the second group. Right? What does this equal? The degrees of freedom from the first group plus the degrees of freedom from the second group equals the degrees of freedom total. That's a T. Right? So, it might be easier for you to remember the formula this way. But, I want you to remember it like I showed you on the previous slide. Why this way, Jose? Because, what if I give you the variance? Then all you gotta do is plug it in and multiply it by its degrees of freedom, right? But, if you have to solve for the variance, remember, you have to solve for the sum of the squares first. You have to solve, right, in order to find the variance, you have to find the sum of the differences squared and then divide it by your degrees of freedom, n minus one, right? The sum of the squares divided by the degrees of freedom. So, if you have to solve for the variance, you can solve first for the sum of the squares and just plug that answer into your formula and it'll work. All right, let's go to the next slide. So again, let me summarize what we said. X bar one is the mean or the average of the first group. X bar two is the mean or the average of the second group. N one is the number of people or things, the number of participants or subjects in group one. N two is the number of people or things in the second group. S one squared is the variance, S squared, for group one. S2 squared, S2 squared, is the variance, the variance, for group two. Remember, the radical, right, tells us what we're doing. We're squaring S, right? And the subscript, this is the superscript, the subscript tells us what group number it is, right? And here is the neat thing about this formula. The answer to this denominator right here, right, is our degrees of freedom that we need to use to look up our critical value, right? That's what we need to know in order to interpret our answer. So let me erase this, right? All right, what are degrees of freedom? Well, your book says degrees of freedom approximate the sample size. Well, okay. If the sample size is seven, right, then n minus one equals six. So six does approximate seven, comes pretty close to it, but I have a better definition that I'm gonna give you in just a second. What else do we know about degrees of freedom based on your book? Right? Degrees of freedom can vary based on the test st statistics selected. What does that mean? That means each statistical test has its own formula for calculating the degrees of freedom, right? For the independent sample t-test, what's the degrees of freedom? It's the degrees of freedom from the first group, df1, plus the degrees of freedom from the second group, right? Right, which equals the total sample size minus the number of groups. Right? The total sample size minus the number of groups. So this would be like big N, the total sample size minus two. Why two? Because we have two groups. This is our degrees of freedom total, right, DF2. So sample size of the first group minus one plus sample size of the second group minus two equals total sample size minus two. Again, why minus two? Because we have two groups, 
Now let me give you the real definitions of what degrees of freedom are. Degrees of freedom is your sample size minus the number of parameters you have to estimate in your calculations when you calculate your statistic. Okay? What does that mean? I'll tell you in a second. Or it's the number of values that are free to vary given one or more mathematical restrictions. Let me explain this first definition. The sampling size is the number of parameters you have to estimate. Let's recall this. We ask people a question, right? How many times did you eat out last week, right? The answer to that question is a variable, right? It can change from observation to observation. It can change from person to person when we ask that question. When we calculate any number from our statistic, right? I'm sorry, when we calculate any number from our sample, we call that a statistic. We use statistics as our best guess of what that number is going to be in the population. Any number that refers to the population is a parameter. So look, we use the mean of our sample to estimate the mean in the population. And guess what? We also use our variance to estimate what the variance is in the population, right? That would be sigma squared. And remember, these are Greek letters. Parameters are always written with Greek letters. So this is being used to estimate that. What's the formula for this? It's the sum of the differences squared. Oh, look. Our formula has an estimate in it. This is being used to estimate that. Since we have one estimate in our formula, we have to pay a penalty. That's why we subtract one from n. This will artificially inflate our answer. We'll make it a little bit bigger. Why? Because this is an estimate. This is being used to estimate that. That's why we have a minus one here. Because our formula has an estimate in it. Okay. That explains the first definition that I gave you. Jose, what was the second definition that you gave us? Or it's the number of values that are free to vary given one or more mathematical restrictions. Let's take a look at that, right? Let's pretend that I'm showing you this problem right here, right? Something plus something equals seven. And I tell you, hey, pick any number in the world. What's a good number? Let's say three. I can pick any number in the world that I want to pick, but I pick three. Can I pick any number now? No. Now I am restricted. Now there's only one answer that can make this true. It can only be four, right? The minute I use up all my freedom, everything after that is restricted, right? This first blank can be any number. It can be five. But the minute all my freedom is used up, this number becomes restricted. There's only one number that I can put in here to make this equation true, right? So you have one degree of freedom here because whatever number you put in the first blank determines what the second number must be. This is free. This is restricted. There's only one free space, so you only have one degree of freedom. Okay, let's look at this problem here. Pick any number in the world. All right, five. Pick any number in the world. 10. Now I have 15. Can I pick any number in the world here? No. This number can only be negative eight. So this was free to be whatever it wanted to be. This was free, but the minute I used up all my freedom, this is restricted. So how much freedom did I have? I had two degrees of freedom, right? I have two degrees of freedom. Since I can choose any two numbers for the first two blanks, right? There is some value which still makes the equation true. There's only, this becomes restricted. 
So this is free, this is free, which is why I have two degrees of freedom. And that's basically what's happening once you calculate an average, right? All the numbers, once you calculate an average, right? Once I say the average is five, right? If the first person is six and the second person is four, what does the third person have to be so that the average stays five? Well, they can only be five, right? Because when I sum it up, 15, when I divide by three, that means the average would be five, right? So this would have been free to be anything it wanted to be. This is free, but this is restricted, so I only have two degrees of freedom. So once we use up all our freedom, then we become restricted. That's what we mean by degrees of freedom. So 